Well, last week we kicked off a new series called Games We Play. And uh, if you missed the message, uh, do yourself a favor and go back. Uh, Andy did an incredible job kicking off this series. I was encouraged, challenged, had a lot to think about and had a lot of great conversations this week as a result of it. So um, I'd love for you to go back and check it out if you you didn't get to hear the message last week. Before we get started though, I need to um, uh, make a confession uh, related to something he talked about last week. Andy grew up, he said he had no brothers, no competitive uh, really edge in his family. They sort of avoid, he sort of avoided competition growing up. Um, Not me. I'm definitely the person that he called overly competitive. Um, Ask anybody who knows me, I asked my family, asked my team, asked my kids. Uh, I grew up in a family of five competitive extroverts and we were loud and fiercely competitive all the time. I don't let my kids win. I don't let newbies win, rookies win, weaker people win. I grew up with a youth pastor that told me, if you have to, cheat to win. So that's just... (laughs) I just want to give you my background up front. I'm completely opposed, by the way, to the everyone gets a trophy thing. There are winners and looters. Can we get rid of that, by the way, in our society? Anybody for that? Rousing applause. I don't know about that. people watching other places at your campus or your location, if people are for that or not, but we are uh, here at Buckhead Church. Um, <laughs> As a young leader, I did discover, though, that uh, competition is a strength. Marcus Buckingham told me that in his book, Now Now Discover Your Strengths. And um, I sort of have leaned into that. But uh, relationally, which is what we're talking about, the games we play in relationships, uh, uh, there is one of one arena that we that I discovered it's, it's not a strength, and that is in relationships. And I was slow to learn what Andy pointed out last week is that a game in relation, when it comes to relationships, a game that requires a loser is a game nobody wins. Because when one person wins and one person loses, it creates a a distance in the relationship. It creates a fracture oftentimes. And at work, you know, for me, being overly competitive uh, as a young leader led me to see other people on my team as competitors as opposed to partners. And that does not make a good teammate, obviously. Um, And with friends and family, I I can be critical and um, it can create gaps in my relationships. And and so this is something I, I, you know, Andy says to always speak out of your weakness. So I'm sort of assigned this topic. Um, One particular game I was really good at um, was this one. It was the blame game. And in relationships, as you know, this can be a killer in relationships. But I got really good at convincing somebody, and some of you are good at this too, that outcomes were not my fault. And I could figure out how to, how to argue, argue my way out of, or reason my way out of, or explain my way out of just about anything. And I got so good at it, I convinced myself I was actually winning when I wasn't. Um, but this has become one of the, the a, a real a growth area for me, honestly, in my life over the last probably 20 or 30 years. And and probably because of really the work God's done in my life, it's something that's benefited me personally and relationally and professionally in terms of my growth more than just about anything else as I've learned how to use my, my competitive instincts in the right way and not, not in, in ways that are damaging and hurtful. So today, here's what I wanna do. I wanna discover uh, some things that we can learn um, and that I've learned, but through this really fascinating story in the Old Testament, um, through a very familiar Old Testament uh, personality, even if you didn't grow up in church, you probably know who this is. We're gonna look at the story of Moses and it's, it's not the one that Charlton Heston where they part the Red Sea. I'm going to reference that, but um, it's sort of after that. And Mo- Moses actually documents his own involvement and his own wrestling with the blame game three specific times. So in the Bible, if you're not familiar with the Bible, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books, they're attributed to Moses. Now we know because some of the details were written uh, after, some of the details of after his life that were included. We know there were other editors and other contributors, but on a whole, the primary author of the first five books known as the Pentateuch or the, the Torah were Moses. And, and at the very end, at the very end of his life and the last book the, in Deuteronomy, Three different times, he's blaming the people of Israel for something. We're gonna discover what that is in just a second. He says, because of you, the Lord became angry with me. And, and again, he's, he's building a case. It's near the end of his life. He, God's angry with me. He's angry. He was angry with the nation, but God's angry with me because of you. Because of you, he wouldn't listen to me. I didn't even get a chance to explain. I didn't get a chance to, to explain my case. Because of you, this is why he so, solemnly swore that I would not cross the Jordan and enter into the good land, enter into the promised land. They're right on the edge of the promised land. And Moses is saying, you're the reason. 
God was angry with me. You're the reason he wouldn't listen to me and I couldn't reason with him. You're the reason I'm not getting to go into the land that he's given you and he's given our people. And and for context, we sort of have to back up because there's two parallel events that happen that he's sort of referring to that are related to each other. The first one is in Exodus chapter 17. Now in Exodus chapter 17, just a, a quick, quick, uh, history lesson. Um, the people of Israel were in slavery in Egypt. And then God sent Moses to lead them out of Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea. That was the, the parting of the Red Sea. They went to Mount Sinai. God gives them not just the law, the Ten Commandments, a whole bunch of instructions about how they're to live and how they relate to each other. And he asked them to trust him on their way as they're journeying from Mount Sinai to the promised land. Now they don't know this, but they're gonna end up wandering in the desert for 40 years. And we're gonna look at a second event that, that's a parallel to, the, to what happened in Exodus 17 in Numbers 20. Now in both of these, these places in the Bible, if you were to look these up, and I would encourage you to later, two, these are the two instances where water comes from a rock. And there's 40 years between these. One is when they just set out from Mount Sinai. They're just headed out on their journey. And the other one is 40 years later as they're on the edge of the promised land. Now, in both instances, the people are grumbling and complaining against God and against Moses because they have no water. And they blame Moses specifically, probably because he's right in front of them. He's tangible. They blame him for being an incompetent and unfit leader. In fact, some of them say it would be better if we were in slavery. It'd be better if we were back in Egypt in slavery. It was better. We at least had food and water and, and God's been providing for them, but there, here's a moment where they don't have water. And so Moses cries out to God. He doesn't know what to do. In both instances, he cries out to God. And both times, God instructs Moses to take his staff. Now, the staff represented God's authority and God's power. Um, When when God first called Moses and tried to convince him, hey, you're going to go release my people from Egypt, he he used the staff as a miracle to show Moses his power. He had him throw it down. It turned into a snake, and then he picked it back up. It turned back into a staff. And then it was the same staff that he used to to place in the water that parted the Red Sea when they they walked through on dry ground. And so in both of these instances, um, God tells Moses to take the staff. And the first time in Exodus, in Exodus 17, he, he, God says, hey, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take it. I want you to strike this rock. I'll, the rock I'll show you. He takes him and he, he says, strike this rock. And when he does, God provides an abundance of water um, for the thirst of all the people, for, for all the people and for their animals. The second time is in Numbers chapter 20. And in Numbers chapter 20, I want to look at the details of the story as it doesn't go the same as the first one. In contrast, remember, this is bookending the journey of the people through the wilderness, through the desert, through some difficult circumstances. In Numbers chapter 20, God instructs Moses. He says, you and Aaron, both of you, um, need to go. They are both leading the nation, must take the staff and assemble the entire community. So bring everybody together. And as the people watch, so as the people watch, I want you to speak to the rock over there. And it will pull, and it will, it will pour out its water. So the first time, I want you to strike the rock, but this time, I want you to take the staff, but I don't want you to strike it. I want you to speak to the rock. So Moses says, Moses, accounting for himself, Moses did what he was told, and it's like kind of. Um, Moses, being the author, like the rest of us, is a bit more generous to himself than, than other people are, or than the story reflects. But he, he actually goes on to tell the real events of the story. So this is what Moses did. He took the staff from the place where it was kept for the Lord, and he and Aaron summoned the people uh, to come and gather together at the rock. So, so far, so good. He's doing what God's asked him to do. But this is where things go off the rails. Instead of speaking to the rock, he speaks to the people. And he gathers everybody around the rock. And this is what he says. He says, listen, you rebels. He's sort of scolding them. Listen, you rebels, he shouted. Must we bring you water from this rock? Now, on the surface, it just seems like Moses is frustrated. The moment's got the best of him. He's not the best version of himself. So he's just sort of showing his tail or however you want to say that. But there's a lot more going on here. And we're going to come back to it in a second. But if, if you, when we unpack this story, so this is, this is Numbers chapter 20. And again, there's, there's more details. I, I tell, say, say this to you all the time. You should read your Bible. These stories are fascinating. But there's, there's two things going on here. First, God... God says to Moses, he, it, it, he says, instead this time, instead of striking the rock, I want you to speak to the rock. And this is an important detail. I, I want you, to, I want to, I want you to, to speak to the rock. And this is important because God's instructions um, 
to the nation of Israel in the beginning were, were an act of trust. He said, hey, here's how you, they, they came out of slavery. So they don't know how to act or how to live. And God's saying, hey, here's how we're gonna live in relationship with each other. And here's how you're gonna re- live in relationship uh, with, with uh, other families in the nation. And, and, and so God's asking them all along the way to, to follow his instructions. And he gives some specific instructions to Moses. And, and he says, look, I, I want you to speak to the rock instead of strike it. And so instead of speaking to the rock, he speaks to the, the nation of Israel. And this is what he says. And we're gonna come back to this in a second. But he says, listen, you rebels. And it's, and it's like, this is sort of a, a, derogatory, a derogatory term. That was supposed to be a comma. I, I always say this, but writing and talking at the same time is a little bit challenging. Um, so he, he says, listen, you rebels. And then the second thing he says, must we bring? So first he, he kind of scolds them a, a little bit. And then he says, you know, okay, so, so the burden's gonna be on us again. Must we bring? Must we, must we meet your needs? Must we show up for you? And again, this is important because it's in contrast to what, what's actually going on. I mean, God didn't want him to go scold them. That wasn't, that wasn't the instructions. And Moses is not providing anything for them. And so he sort of steps in and he, he misrepresents God. And then, then Moses, he raised his hand and he struck the rock twice with, with, with the staff. Now, I, I don't know if he struck it the first time, was like, that worked last time. I don't know why it didn't work again. So he struck it again. But after the second time he, he struck it, even though Moses clearly disregards uh, God's instructions, um, water, water gushed out of the rock. So God, this, this, this is remarkable. Moses, so God says, I want you to speak to the rock. And what Moses actually does is he strikes the rock. So he, he, doesn't, he doesn't do what, what God asks him to do. And then, important detail, God still provides. Now, I, I thought about this for a long time, and and it's sort of strange because you would think, you know, Moses didn't do what God, God asked him to do, but God's promise to provide for his people was not conditional. And, and my take on this is that, that, that God promised to provide for the Israelites in the wilderness, and he wasn't going to allow his reputation to be marred by Moses' disobedience. And so that's my opinion. I, that's why I believe God provided the, the water uh, from the rock, but, but there were consequences. And the, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust me enough to demonstrate my holiness to the people of Israel, which this is an interesting phrase. He, essentially, he's saying, Moses, is, Moses, your disobedience, it further diminished people's view of me and my authority and the importance of following my instructions, which again, from the very beginning was, in the beginning, what God was just trying to get them to do was to trust him. to to trust him to provide for them and to lead them to what was good, which is not all that different from what God's asking you and me to do, is to to trust him and follow his specific instructions so that we will will find and will ultimately uh, embrace and and experience the goodness that he has for us. And and this was was serious, and and it had serious consequences, which which is something we're going to come back to in in a minute because um, the truth is, is when things go wrong, or things go poorly, and you know, we, when, when there are consequences, that's, that's when we all wanna, wanna blame somebody. We're looking for somebody to blame. And, and here's what's interesting. There weren't consequences just for Moses. In fact, the Lord, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, and Aaron was there, and some of you know this, sometimes somebody else's irresponsibility or somebody else's disobedience has consequences for you and there are consequences you have to bear, consequences you have to deal with. And, and it wasn't even your fault. You didn't even do anything. And that's the truth for Aaron, at least in this situation. I mean, you could say he didn't stop Moses, but he wasn't the one that struck the rock. He, he certainly didn't strike it twice. But God said to Moses, you and Aaron, you will not lead them into the land that I'm giving them. And so this is, this is fascinating at this point. Moses, in Deuteronomy, he blamed the people of Israel for the reason he wasn't going into the promised land. And we discover, backing up just a little bit in Numbers chapter 20, that it was Moses' own behavior. It was Moses' own decision. 
Now, the, the point of the message today, the 1.0 version of the, of the message today is owning up to your own mistakes, but that's not the, that's not the real point of the message because that's, again, that's 1.0. You're, you're way smarter than that. You're more advanced. You're at least 2.0, maybe 3.0. And, and it includes that, by the way. You should own up for your own mistakes, but that's just simple honesty. You should do what you say and say what you do. I mean, that's a good thing to live by. Do what you say, say what you do. But there's more going on here than this. And the biggest problem in, in this, this situation, this circumstance, and specifically with Moses, was not that he's misrepresenting the facts in Deuteronomy. That's, that's not the problem. The problem is, is Moses is not taking responsibility. And that's really what the blame game is all about. Because when it comes to the blame game, here's, here's the truth. When we're, when we're experiencing consequences, when there's, when there's a problem as a result of somebody's behavior and we're not sure whose it is, or maybe we, we think we know whose it is, the question is for us is who's responsible? Who, who, who do I blame? Who's ultimately responsible for this? And there's two types of people. You actually have one of two choices. And we've all been both of these people sometimes, but there are people that reflexively, in the midst of that, they reflexively assign responsibility to somebody. You, I know who's at fault, or you're at fault, or this is the reason for the problem, and they're good. And again, I told you earlier, I was good at this. It's not my fault. I know how this happened. You, you're blaming some circumstances, or you're blaming somebody else, or you're blaming the situation, or you know something, something you didn't have enough information. There's people that assign blame or assign responsibility, and then there's people that assume it. Those are the two different options. And they're really the only two options. When, when, when something's gone wrong or something's not the way it ought to be and, and we're experiencing something that's, that's less than ideal, we, we wanna know who, who's responsible. And we're looking, we're looking to either assign responsibility because we want something done about it or we assume responsibility. See, the problem wasn't that Moses was losing his cool in a moment of frustration. Remember, there's 40 years that separated these two events. The first water from a rock was when they were just setting out. God had just given them the instructions. They just went in the wilderness. It was like the first major bump where we don't have water. And the people start revolting. You know, they're blaming Moses. In fact, they wanted to stone him. And they're, they're, they're grumbling against God. And we want to go back to Egypt. And then 40 years goes by. And God all along the way is providing for his people. And he's not just providing water, he's providing food. There's manna falling from the sky. He provides quail for them. He provides protection versus their adversaries. I mean, there's all sorts of attacks and people that he wards off. And yet still from, from the beginning through 40 years to this place where they had gotten, where they're on the doorstep of the promised land, it seems like there's no change with the people. They're still blaming and grumbling against God and against Moses. And here's what I'd say, it's no wonder. Their attitude reflected their leader. I mean, this is, this is Moses' posture and you're like, you're speaking against Moses. I'm just reading the story. I mean, this is what happened. Moses isn't taking responsibility. I mean, if he's taking responsibility, I mean, either that or he really is a terrible leader because it's like, you know, you, 40 years later, you're still dealing with the same thing. We've not advanced past, like after all that God has done, after all the ways he's shown up for them, you're still grumbling, complaining, and acting like little children who don't understand, you know, the, the circumstances, the situation. Some of you remember um, the movie, Remember the Titans? You remember, anybody remember that movie? It's a great, a great film. It's it about a football team uh, navigating the racial integration of their high school in the 1970s. And there was two sets of football players that are, that are being put together in this team. And there's two alphas, one from each team. Julius Campbell was one and Gary Bertier was the other. And these two, and they, these are based on true events uh, in, in, a, in a high school that was integrated. And, and these two guys were, were button heads. Heads. And at one point, Bertier, who's the captain of the team, um, he was named captain of the team, he's blaming Julius for having a bad attitude. And all of Julius's buddies and all his guys that came from his team, they're following his attitude and they're like, and he's blaming him for, for having a bad attitude, to which Julius, I think, brilliantly responds. And this is what he says. He says, attitude reflects leadership, captain, which this is true. And if you've ever led anything, you know this is true. And even if you don't consider yourself a leader, when you lead out in any conversation, when things are going wrong, when, when uh, you lead out in things in your company or in your family or in your marriage, the truth is, is people follow. They follow the things that, that, 
the, 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 the sort of the, the pace that you set for them. Now, there's two things that are, that are at play in this blame game, and they're right here in the story. I mean, I told you we we're going to come back to this. He, he starts out and Moses says, listen, you, re- you rebels. And this is, this is him assuming a position in their life. And the, the position he's assuming is he's assuming a position of moral superiority. Now hear me out. Think about this for a second. This is Moses in reality. We don't, we don't think about it, but, but I want you, I'm going to push you to be thoughtful. He's, he's elevating himself by judging them. He's, he sort of made him the, himself the judge. And this is, this is a character judgment. It's not we're rebels or we're the grumblers and we're the complainers. It's you. You're disobedient. You're the ones that aren't listening to God. And he's sort of scolding them. And, and come on, we do this too. When things go wrong. And, and, and again, in your office, in your family, as parents, I mean, I've been terrible. It's like immediately when things go wrong, it's like, what's your problem? What is your, it's, it's not like we don't, we don't look inward and go, now what did I do to set them off? Or what, what's the kind of environment I've set here? Why did they respond that way? Is there something I, we start out with, what's your problem? What's the matter with you? Why are you acting that way? If you weren't so fill in the blank, if you weren't so selfish, if you weren't so incompetent, if you weren't so self-indulged, if you weren't so whatever it is. And it's so easy to immediately put ourselves in a position of moral superiority. Like it's like, hey, there's, it, this isn't my issue. I, there can't be anything wrong with me. And we don't realize it, but this is, this is a subtle powering up in a relationship, which never goes well. And, and the powering up is actually to escape discomfort the discomfort of bearing the responsibility. In fact, Brene Brown's written a lot about this. And when things go wrong, we don't want to be the one who bears the responsibility. We don't want it to be our fault. Brene Brown says it this way. This is what she says. She said, blame is simply the discharging of discomfort and pain. I love that. The discharging of discomfort and pain. When when you take on the role of judge, what you're doing is you're taking this discomfort you feel of somebody's responsible, somebody's at fault. And what you do is, instead of bearing that and assuming it, you're trying to transfer. We assign it to somebody else so that we can transfer that discomfort to somebody else so that we don't have to deal with it. Not realizing all along the way, that just distances the relationship and it pushes them away. That powering up, that superiority, it's not me, it's you. It's actually, it's actually a desire to remove ourselves from the discomfort that we feel because something's our fault. And, and, and you know this, assigning blame never closes a gap that exists in a relationship. It, it always widens the gap. If you're a leader, or, uh, you're, you're on a team or you're married or you're a parent, you, you've seen this, you've experienced this. You've pointed your, your finger at somebody, you've powered up against somebody, you've assigned guilt. And what happened? There was a gap. You didn't move closer. They weren't like, oh, thank you so much. Give me a hug. Thanks for pointing that out, that, that, you know, that I'm at fault and I'm the, I'm the one to blame and this is all my fault. Thank you for giving me all that baggage and the responsibility. No, that never happens. Blame sabotages our relationships and it sabotages our relationships with people we actually care about and, and relationships that we actually care about. And, and it's because... We take this position of judge and, and we see ourselves or, or, or we set up our, ourselves to be morally superior like we know the problem. And instead of working it out together or figuring it out, we just decide, I, I wanna get this discomfort off my plate. The second thing that, that blame does is it allows us to be a victim. And it actually doesn't just allow us to be a victim. It, it, it causes us to kind of spin, spin ourselves or spiral ourselves into a victim mentality. And this victim mentality, it, it, it's, it's subtle. Talenty, sorry. Uh, it, it's subtle in, in when you see this with Moses. But when Moses strikes the rock, he, 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 he strikes the rock right after he not only sort of accused them or, or, or kind of looked down on them, but he, he says this thing like, must we bring out? Like he's setting himself up a little bit like, like I'm the hero. Like, I'm going to deliver, but Moses knows full well that, that this is a facade. His powering up is a facade because he's not bringing water out of the rock. He knows he doesn't have the power to do that. He's positioning himself, himself and Aaron as the victim. It's like, oh, so we have to, we're going to have to clean up your mess again. We're going to have to take up after you. Look at all this. Okay, I guess I'm just going to have to bear the responsibility. Of that. And that's, that's this victim mentality. 
And the truth is, is the people's disdain for their, their circumstances as they've been wandering through the desert and the wilderness, which this is hard. Some of you have been in a season like this where, where it's, it's difficult. You've been in a wilderness and you're wondering, you know, are we ever gonna get to the promised land? Is God actually gonna deliver us? Like what's gonna happen? And, and their disdain for their circumstances um, and it led to their disobedience and complaining. And honestly, some of that is why they were, their disobedience was why they were still wandering. I mean, they could have made it into the, the promised land way sooner. But, but the irony is Moses' reaction is no different than theirs. Mo, they're reacting to their circumstances. Moses is reacting to them. They're both playing the blame game. And the real problem was Moses as the leader, his inability to assume responsibility for what was going on, to take ownership for, for the bitterness and cynicism that he was, that he was harboring in, in his own heart. Like there was something going on inside of Moses that if he had dealt with that and he had wrestled with that, that would have changed things. And, and, and he was bitter about the people that God had entrusted to his leadership and the situation that they were in as a people. The, I, just to press a little further, I mean, again, and, and it's so easy to, to look back and I'm not trying to make this about slandering Moses, but like, here's what, and you know this, weak people blame. Weak leaders blame. And in doing so, here's what happens. When they blame other people, they surrender influence. They surrender leadership. They lose trust and they lose the confidence of others. You've seen this before. Some of you, you've experienced this in your workplace where you see somebody who's always blaming somebody else and you're like, well, if you have no control, I need to put somebody in that seat that has control or that can do something about it because nothing's their responsibility. They're not assuming any responsibility in, in the situation. And you're like, well, if you're not gonna assume responsibility, I need somebody else. And they always play themselves as a victim. Other people are against me. People are undercutting me or they're sabotaging me, my job. And, and the truth is, is from a psychological perspective, a victim mentality is functionally a debilitating coping mechanism. That's all it is. You're trying to cope with the situation. You're trying to deal with it. And, and the way you're coping by getting rid of the blame, getting rid of the, the, the responsibility, getting rid of the weight or the discomfort is what you're doing is, is you're keeping yourself from being able to grow and to change, to, to impact things. In fact, Robert Anthony, he points this out. He says, Dr. Robert Anthony, he says this, when you blame others, you give up your power to change, to change you and to change the circumstances around you. The, the moment you transfer responsibility, here's what's happening. When you assign somebody else responsibility, when you transfer that responsibility, you're abdicating your power to change things. You basically just said, no, no, this isn't about me. This isn't something, I don't need to do anything. So I'm gonna abdicate this and you don't know if the other person's gonna take, assume responsibility or not. You're trying to lay blame. You're trying to assign blame to them, but you don't know if things are gonna change for you or the circumstances around you. And this is what, this is what Moses did. In fact, if you ask me, I think Moses abdicated his role as leader well before God removed him from it. Moses wasn't leading them. They're blaming each other. It's, it's like somebody needed to take responsibility for how things are. And the truth is, some of you, by the way, you thought you were gonna get out of here today uh, without a circle. And I have to draw some circles. I like circles. Venn diagrams are very helpful for me. And, and here's the thing. These, these have relationship. These consequences and responsibility, they have relationship. And, and here's what happens. When you assign responsibility... You blame things and you blame people and you blame circumstances. And, and again, this is outside of you, but the people that choose to assume responsibility, these are people that actually change things. And you have a choice and, and that's, that's your choice. It, it's not about, by the way, this is not about who's at fault. This isn't, this isn't a, a mission of guilt when you assume responsibility. That's, that's not what this is about. But, but where this, this cross-section, what, what happens right here when, when somebody decides to assume responsibility, what happens right there in that spot is, is they actually become a change agent. See, things like, you know, whose fault it is, and, and if I assume this, everybody's going to think it's my fault or, or that I'm guilty of something or that this is my fault. Those are the things that lure us into the blame game. 
Don't, don't let those things lure you in, sucker you into that game. Don't worry about that. That's not, that's not the point. The point is something's not right. And somebody's got to do something about it. Somebody's got to handle the situation. Somebody's got to lead. Somebody's got to take charge. Somebody needs to change something. And this is about what it's going to take for somebody to take responsibility so that something changes for the better. Did you know that, that and this is a fact, all the studies show it, blaming actually makes your life worse in every category, in every category. Statistically, employees who blame, you ready for this? They aren't promoted as often, they make less money, they get fired more, and they have lower levels of job satisfaction. People who blame, statistically, all four of those things are true in the workplace. Blame is the number one predictor of failed relationships. Do you know this? John Gottman, you can go look up his research. He, he's done the most prolific research related to divorce. Blame is the number. He basically says this, with, with over a 90% success rate, they could, they could identify people's relationships who would no longer, with people that were coming in for crisis counseling, people who would not make it. Basically by this, if they're blaming each other for the problem, they're pointing, pointing at each other, that, that is they see the problem between them and they're pointing at the other person, looking through the problem going, you're the problem. And if you'll fix this, then we can have a relationship. Those relationships didn't make it. The two people that got next to each other and went, we're able to go, we have a problem over there. What are we going to do about it? Those are the relationships that succeeded. With a greater than 90% success rate, blames the number one predictor in failed relationships. Socioeconomically, people who blame circumstances, who blame family of origin, social structures, look, that, that may all be valid, but those people don't advance in society and they experience lower levels of happiness. All the studies show it. So it's, it's like, as a friend of mine says, people who blame things rarely change things. And you, you have the choice. You can, either, you can either be somebody who assigns responsibility and you can blame things, or you can be a person who goes, you know what, this isn't about being at fault. I don't, I don't, really, I don't really care what people think. Somebody's got to do something about this. And, and things need to change. This is what they do. They, and this is the antidote. The antidote to, to the blame game is to embrace your ability to assume responsibility. Did you know you actually have a choice? You have the ability to assume rather than assign responsibility. Doesn't matter if it's your fault or not. It doesn't matter if you're guilty or not. It doesn't matter what the circumstance. If you want to see things change, you have to embrace your ability to assume Responsibility, you know, the best leaders do that. The best partners, the best spouses, the best parents, the best roommates, they all do this. The, the proper way to change the world, you hear a lot of people talking about changing the world. The proper way to change the world is not to try to change the world. There's no reason to believe, just bad news for you today, there's no reason to believe you have the ability to change the world, but you can change your world and you can work on your world. And as each of us do that, that's how you change the world. And so the question is like, what's gone wrong? What's not going right in your world? What, what's, what's something that, that, that this, this, is a, this is a difficult circumstance. I didn't see myself in this situation. And, and, and I'm not just talking about like somebody did something that hurt your feelings. It's like, I'm not sure how to get out of this and I'm not sure how I got into this. And I'm not, it's, it's hard to even lay blame. And I could blame a whole bunch of other things, but that's not gonna change anything. My question is, how can you take responsibility for it? What could you do, however big or small, to fix or change or bear the burden of that for yourself or for, for other people around you? Do you know there, there's remarkable and useful people doing this every day who are finding incredible purpose in assuming responsibility for things that aren't their responsibility. In fact, many of them are assuming responsibility for other people's irresponsibility. And they could play the blame game. They could play the blame game in their marriage. They could play the blame game uh, in, their, in their office. They could play the blame game uh, in, in, their, in the healthcare system. They could play the blame game in our education system. But instead, there's remarkable people in circumstances and situations that are so difficult and so challenging. And they're not assigning responsibility. 
they're assuming responsibility. And because of it, things are changing. They're changing inside of them and they're changing around them. They're changing for other people who need them to show up, who need them to assume some responsibility. The best example I've seen of this in my life, and you may have seen a lot of examples of this, the best example I've seen in, this, in my life, and I'm gonna do my best to get through this, is my mom. A little over 30 years ago, I watched my mom, I was 17 years old, I watched my mom um, care for my dad. My dad was, um, had been diagnosed with renal cell carcinoma and it was aggressive and it was late stage and it took him really fast and he deteriorated at home right in front of us. I mean, it, he got to the place where he could do nothing for himself. I mean, she fed him and she bathed him and she clothed him, she cared for him, she took care of his sores. Like, it, was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was really difficult to watch as a teenager and to comprehend and, and to, to, to figure out. And um, a little over a year ago, um, me and my siblings discovered, um, so my mom was remarried about eight years after my dad passed away and has been married for 20 plus years again um, to my stepdad. And um, he had a rare disease and it, it looked like she was gonna face her worst nightmare again. And... Um, he came home and there was nothing else they could do. And we, we actually went up to, to visit her uh, a year ago, Mother's Day, and we, we didn't realize how difficult the situation. I remember walking in the house thinking, this reminds me of when I was 17. And me and my siblings were all like, mom, you don't have to do this. Like we can get help and we can get care. Like, um, you shouldn't have to do this again. No one, no one should have to do that. In fact, I remember saying, you, you can't do this. And in her own words, in her own way, she said, you watch me. Both situations involved some negligent care. She could have blamed that. Um, both needed help with absolutely everything. There's, there was no dignity. And she could have been like, God, why me? Why do I have to do this again? 20 plus years of marriage again, and this is what I get. I've been faithful. I mean, she doesn't deserve that. Who's to blame for that? Not her. It's not fair. In fact, I wrestled with it. I was like, okay, God, explain this to me. Like, help me understand. Like, this feels cruel. This is not what she signed up for. Except it was. That's what she would tell you. In her mind, through a daily choice every day, what she decided was, I, I don't know why me, but I'm gonna assume responsibility for the role that God's given me. She saw both these men as men who were entrusted to her. Think about that. She chose to take responsibility both times I was there to the very end. She was there for the very last breath for both of them at home. Now, who, who would do that? Who could do that? Who, who can bear that? And, and I thought about this for a long time and, and talked to my mom and here, here's, here's the best answer I can give you is a faithful follower of Jesus, that's who one who embraces the power of the Holy Spirit that's in, in them and borrows on the strength and chooses to follow in his footsteps. Now look, I know that's not fair, but it takes away all of our excuses, doesn't it? And the truth is, is it's not just my mom, it's, it's what Jesus did for us. When he humbled himself and he entered into our mess, taking responsibility for a problem that was not his fault. Here's what I learned from my mom. You know what I learned from my mom? This is remarkable. In Christ, you're stronger than things are terrible. You are. Some of you, you need to hear this. You came today or you logged online or you're watching or you're traveling down the road and, and the reality is, is you needed to hear this. In Christ, with his power in you, you are stronger than things are terrible. 
you're thinking about quitting. You're thinking you can't go on. But I want you to know you can face the worst of odds, the ugliest of atrocities, the greatest of evils, and you can overcome them by the power of Christ that lives in you. He will sustain you. Just like he did the people in the wilderness. This is amazing. 1,500 years later, the Apostle Paul is looking back and he's referring to these two instances where God provided water from the rock in the wilderness. God was always providing, always sustaining. And reflecting back, this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. This is New Testament now. He's looking back and he says, they all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock was Christ. This is what he's saying. Is, is if you lean into Christ and you'll trust him and you allow him to guide you, he will sustain you. He will provide for you. I'm not sure what you walked in, in with today. I'm not sure what you're in the midst of. But what would it look like right where you are to embrace your ability? Because you have a greater ability than you realize. It's actually a supernatural ability. For those of you who have the life of Christ in you, you have a supernatural ability to assume responsibility for whatever comes your way, even if it's not your fault. In fact, in some cases, because it's not your fault. And somebody needs you to step in just like you needed somebody to step in when Christ gave his life for you. Instead of turning your back on it and turning away from it. If you turn around and you take on the suffering and the misery and the pain or the discomfort, here's what I promise. Things will begin to change. They'll change in you first. And then they'll begin to change around you because it's how God works through his people. And he is with you. He will guide you. He will strengthen you. And he will provide for you. But you have to quit the blame game. You have to quit pretending you're morally superior. You have to quit playing the victim. And you have to assume responsibility. The choice is yours. You can participate in blaming things. Or you can choose to partner with God in changing things in your life and in the world around you. Let me pray for you. God, I pray for everyone who's hearing the sound of my voice right now, wherever circumstances they're in, I pray for somebody who walked in today and, and their life circumstances are overwhelming. And they were thinking about quitting. They were thinking, there's no way I can go on. God, I pray that they would hear today that the truth is they can't do it on their own, but if they'd lean into you and they would trust you, that you're more than able to care for them and to guide them and to hold them up. Your promise is that not always that, that you'll provide a way out for us or that you'll take these circumstances away from us, but you promise to give us the ability to stand up under them, meaning you give us the ability to bear the burden of them, that your strength is enough for us. Your grace is enough. So I just pray for your grace and for your mercy for people who are facing things today and they're wondering if they'll ever make it to the other side of it. They're wondering if they'll ever make it to their promised land, the goodness that you've, uh, you've promised each one of us. I pray that somehow today they would sense your nearness. I pray for somebody who, who's here who's not yet chosen to trust you and they're wondering if they can make it through. I, I pray that whatever's stirring in their heart right now would cause them to look up and choose to want to trust you, to guide their lives, to follow in your way, to trust your son Jesus and to experience his life and your spirit come inside of them and empower them to bear whatever it is they're facing in this life. You told us in this life we'd have trouble, but that you have overcome the whole world. And so may we be people who embrace your power to be overcomers in our world. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.